Greetings, everyone, and welcome to day three of the online symposium, Practical Theologies and Wisdom Traditions in Spiritual Care, sponsored by collaboration between the International Association of Spiritual Care and Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary. To those in Europe and Africa, good afternoon. To those in Asia, good evening. To those in the US and Canada and South America, good morning. I'm Leah Thomas. I am a colleague of Daniel Scapani's. I'm the Assistant Professor of Pastoral Care and Contextual Education at Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary in Elkhart, Indiana in the US. For those of you who have been with us throughout the past couple of days, we have had some amazing presentations from scholars and practitioners from Hinduism, Judaism, the indigenous wisdom traditions, Buddhism, and humanism. Today, we will hear from representatives from Christianity and Islam. In particular, Dr. Esther, Esther Ecolatze, um, who will speak to us from Christianity, and Drs. Mahmoud Abdul Abdallah and Dr. Nazila Iskandarova. Excuse my mispronunciation there. And in light of the wealth of information and words that we've been fed over the last two days, I propose that we begin today with a practice of attending to our embodied selves, so attending to our bodies. Um, the exercise that I'm going to lead you in is a brief exercise that is drawn from an embodied trauma healing modality known as somatic experiencing. It was created by Peter Levine. Some of you might be familiar with it. As you'll see, however, and as we um, practice, practice this together, it actually incorporates practices from many of our own religious traditions. So I invite you today to enter into this practice to the degree you feel comfortable. Um, please know you can opt out at any time or choose not to participate altogether. And you can um, participate in this practice either with your eyes open, um, closed, or, um, or gaze softly down. So again, whatever feels right in your body today. So I just invite you to get comfortable wherever you might be seated. Um, notice if your body would like to move at all. Um, and just choose a posture where you can kind of be open and receptive for the next few moments as we practice this together. And as we come into this space together, um, I invite you just to notice the feeling of your body seated in wherever you might be seated. So notice perhaps the feeling of the air on your skin. Notice the points of contact between your body and the chair or the floor. Just take a few moments. And um, as a mentor of mine says, sit and know you're sitting. And as you're seated here, also just notice that support is both given by the floor or chair or whatever you might be give, seated on and support is received. So can you just allow your body to receive the support that's offered either by the floor or by the chair? And just take a few moments. And maybe even notice where in your body you feel the most rooted or grounded. And if it feels okay, just directing all of your attention to that place or places within your body. And if it feels okay, I'm going to invite you to bring your attention to your breath, to really just notice your inhales and your exhales, and notice as you bring your attention to your breath, if it would like to deepen or shift or not. And as thoughts come and go, um, that's fine. That's the mind, that's what it does. We try not to judge it, but just see if you can gently direct your attention back to your inhales and your exhales. So seeing if you can follow one complete inhale from its very beginning to its very end and then one complete exhale from its very beginning to its very end. Can you be with this inhale and this exhale? And 
I'm going to invite you to gently shift your attention to exploring your space through sound. So just begin to notice what sounds you might be hearing. Maybe these are inside the room you're in, perhaps they're outside the room, perhaps they're even outside the building. And instead of linking sound to what might be creating the sound, as sometimes we do, I invite you to notice the quality of the sound. So notice the pitch. Is it constant? Notice the tenor. And as you're attending to the sounds around you, I invite you to notice what's happening inside of yourself, your somatic self, your body. So notice, is there any tension? Is there any tightness? Is there a temperature? Is there a tingling? Spaciousness? Just notice what might be happening as you continue to attend to the sounds that surround you. When it feels okay in your body, we're going to shift to noticing our sense of touch, to orienting through touch. So you could either touch something like the fabric you're wearing. You could take one hand and make contact with the other. You could just notice the weight of your body as it touches the chair. Um, but just take a moment and really explore the here and now through your sense of touch. So notice how you might describe what's happening as you engage in reflection on touch. And again, as you're attending to touch, can you be, can you also be attentive to what might be happening inside of you? So again, perhaps areas of constriction, areas of spaciousness or openness. Does your breath deepen? Does it become more shallow? Are you more or less present in this moment? Just take a few moments to attend to touch. And when it feels okay in your body, if your eyes have been closed or soft, um, I invite you to just allow them to open and to gently start to scan your environment. Nice and easy, really just taking in everything around you and noticing if you would like to keep scanning your environment or perhaps there's a place where your eyes would like to rest something that they enjoy looking at. So just notice. And whether you're continuing to scan the environment or whether you've found something on which your eyes would like to rest, again, I invite you to just attend to what might be happening inside of your body as you continue to orient through sight. So notice any areas of tightness or spaciousness. Notice any tingling, any temperature. Notice how it impacts your breath. So together, we've engaged in a few practices. We've engaged in some grounding. We've engaged in attention to our breath. We've engaged in orienting through sounds, through sight, and through touch. And I invite you to just consider for a moment, which of these gave you the most relationship to the here and now? Which made you feel the most grounded or the most centered? And I'm just going to invite you to return to whatever that was for you for our, our final few moments together.
So perhaps it was grounding, perhaps it was attention to the breath, perhaps it was sound or sight or touch. Just return there. Taking a final few moments wherever you are. And then in your own time, just allowing your eyes to open if they've been closed and coming back to this space and our time together. And welcome back. So today, our presentations, as I mentioned, um, will be from the traditions of Christianity and also from Islam. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Es Esther Ekolatse. Um, she is the professor of pastoral theology and world Christianity at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston, Illinois. Her interests and her expertise reflect an African-centric analysis of Western culture and religious life. She studies the gendered body, cultural anthropological dimensions of medicine, health, and healing, and also their implications for suffering, death, dying, and care at the end of life. Dr. Ekolatse's interdisciplinary work includes biblical hermeneutics, systematic theology, Jungian analytical psychology, pneumatology, and pastoral care and counseling. There are many other things that Dr. Ektolatse has done, and I invite you all to um, consult the biographies that you were sent earlier um, in, your, in our time together. Um, but today, I just want to welcome um, Dr. Ekolatse. Thank you very much. Please send me your introduction. It's better than I think of what I have said about myself. Oh, thank you. I, I'm happy to. <laughs> I am so happy to be here. And um, thank you all, especially Daniel, for inviting me to, to be part of this um, uh, seminar. And I have titled what I am about to say, uh, a reformed practical theology for spiritual care in a spirited world. Some of the things I have to say here have already been written somewhere else that you might uh, see later. But it is still pertinent today because of the way practical theology, pastoral care, and counseling, spiritual care is uh, framed within the modern university. You know, once upon a time, theology was the queen of the, of, of the sciences until it became relegated to the margins. And with that, uh, playing for front seat among theologians themselves, relegated what many of us do in terms of practical theology, pastoral care and counseling to what some might call the third area or area four, depending on the language your school uses. And um, uh, using the word crusade is very bad in our modern day, but I am a crusader for um, helping people reacquaint themselves with the fact that in reality, all theology is practical theology. And that practical theology from which we get our pastoral care counseling, our spiritual care is the oldest form of theology and finds its sources in the Christian perspective uh, from the Bible. It is, it is, what we see as the way that humans navigate life with God and with one another in integrity. And the incarnation 
offers us a glimpse of what this life with God and others looks like. The epistles that are left for us in the scriptures have the same purpose, addressing issues of the everydayness of life and how we might be formed into the image of Christ. And this is the goal. So we might say indeed that all of theology has its wellspring in practical theology. And we can even say that practical theology is the science of God in the logic of the spirit. It is really a search for how the God we theologize about is showing up in the everydayness of the life of people. It is not wrong to say that the ultimate concern of proper theology ought to be the human. Theological anthropology is key to understanding God. The center of scripture, Christian scripture, is the human. The human formed in freedom and love and made the object of divine love. So while we may all be doing our theology as if we would know God in the minutest detail, and those of us in the reformed tradition are notorious for, for, for that, God is busy centering the human within the cosmos as the object of desire. So we would not be exaggerating if we made the claim that God is anthropocentric. This is all God is doing, being about humans. And this phrase that I just uh, mentioned, God is anthropocentric, is important to the kind of reflections that I will be making towards the end of of my presentation and and i hope that you can keep that in your memory vein as we try to use theology and the social sciences and for me psychology in tandem to help people in ways that help them live their lived religion in the everydayness of life but but first oh i should be sharing my screen i'm sorry Unless you already have that, I should be. Hmm, I'm not sure. Um, um, Leah. Yes. Am I invited to share screen? You should be able to share screen because um, okay. I believe you are a co-host. Yes. Uh hmm. -huh. And I think I just. what is on my desktop is no longer my screen so okay so then I go here and do share screen okay can we see now yes looks great ah, so sorry no problem <laughs> so in a sense I was trying to give us a brief history of practical theology and and made uh, reference to at least the biblical and a, a bit of the medieval and, and the modern and the kind of fragmentation in theological spaces today, theological education that has caused us the problem of the division of our theological enterprise and made practical theology almost an applied theology which is not really the, the case at all. It is not that we take what theologians think about and take it and then go and apply it almost like a panacea to an illness. This is not like the doctors write the prescription and the nurse then you know, administers and follows it. That is not the case. And 
in our modern times, the work of Don Browning helps us to understand the kind of movement that is going on in Christian practical theology when we think in terms of theory and practice and tells us that we do not have a theory that we go and apply. In reality, what we have is practice that informs theory that then goes back to refine practice so that at the end, what we have is a practice laden theory. So in reality, the theologizing we do starts from practice, starts by observation and bringing our practice to theories that we may then formulate and go back and refine our practice. And you can think of any examples of spiritual care that you en engage. And moreover, it is not just an application of an idea, but within itself, if you can see the screen, uh, Swinton and Mohad stress the point that practical theology is hermeneutical because you're doing deep thinking across disciplines. It is hermeneutical because it recognizes the centrality of interpretation in the way, now I have lost part of my screen and I need to move, okay. It is hermeneutical because it recognizes the centrality of interpretation in the way that human beings encounter the world and try to read the text of that encounter, both the human as a living human document, as well as the text we bring, whether our psychologies, our sociologies. It is correlational. So it is hermeneutical. It is correlational because it necessarily tries to hold together and correlate at least three different perspectives, the situation we are exploring, the Christian tradition, and another source of knowledge, for me, psychology, that is intended to enable deeper insight and understanding. And then it is also critical. It is a critical discipline because it approaches both the world and our interpretations of the Christian tradition with a hermeneutic of suspicion always aware of the reality of human fallenness and the complexity of forces which shape and structure our encounters in the world. One, it is hermeneutical, it is correlational, and it is critical. Over time, people have tried in search of a method to figure out how then we pair our theologies with our social sciences to ameliorate human issues. Tracy, following David Tracy, I mean, following Tillich, talks to us about a correlational approach. But the problem with correlational approaches is that it does not give us a way to explore some of the hermeneutical tasks we said were important for doing the work of care. Because practical theology is a theology of action in human life as it is lived in social situations. And needs to be interdisciplinary in a way that transcends just correlation, where you use scripture and scriptural analogy as correlating to what things are going on in the world and apply it topically. It is more than that. And so correlation has limits because for instance, how do we determine that the cross, resurrection, or the incarnation give theology conceptual priority over social sciences in 
practical theological enterprise, for instance. We can't. What depth of questioning is legitimate when we say that normative tests, which Tracy invites us to look at, question the current crisis? Maybe any ferment in this world. What, what, what legitimate? What legitimates normativity of the theological text or whatever text you have? For me, Christian, Islamic, Buddhist, what, what, what legitimates that normativity? And do these normative texts and the current situations they seek to address have the same bargaining power in how we frame the problem? Or does one always have superiority over, over the other? Do they have the same bargaining power in depth of questioning a hermeneutical interpretation? Or is it the case that the call to this enterprise that is practical theology, the theological text traditions remain normative even if interpretations are challenged in their overarching methodological framework? Is there a way in which social sciences can challenge theological insights? So correlation alone was not helpful. And then there is the approach that is integration, which is interdisciplinary. But the problem with that approach over time is also that very soon reductionism became the issue that because I'm speaking theologically and theology is my primary language, I quickly read psychological texts as if they were theological texts and use theological interpretive lenses to look at psychological texts or the obverse, what we'll call a psychological reductionism where I use psychological lenses to read theological texts, even scripture. A prime example will be to read the story of Jesus, to hear Jesus say Abba, and then quickly say, ah, that is an engendered self. That is a self that understands the absence of father to the point that it then projects a transcendent father and makes Abba and makes God that. And that is what we're calling uh, reductionism. So there's a danger with doing the kind of integration that can easily become uh, reductionistic. In even more recent time is a Christological approach to method that follows the work of James Loder and uh, Deborah Van Dusen Hansinger that tries to avoid the bifurcation that occurs in correlation as well as the reductionism that can happen in integration gone awry. And they relate theology and the social sciences according to the Chalcedonian pattern. And they use this following Karl Barth's insights of the way the humanity and divinity of Jesus coincide. Jesus is both human and divine. The humanity and divinity are inseparable. There is never one without the other. They are intensive unity. And yet they are differentiated. The humanity is not the divinity and the divinity is not the humanity. They walk side by side constantly, but they are asymmetrically related in terms of conceptual priority of the divinity because this is the pre-existence son that comes in human form. So there is an asymmetric, not a symmetrical order of relation between the divinity and the humanity. 
of Jesus. And they bring that to the relation of theology and psychology for human uh, enterprise, for, for, for dealing with care. And they suggest that theology and the, the psychology should be conceived of as languages. Languages with their own underlying grammar and vocabulary and not to be conflated. Theological language should stay within its lane of theology and psychological language stay within its lane of, of, of psychology, never to be conflated but they can be used in tandem and differentiated within any pastoral situation that you are looking at. And they could come together in what Hansinger suggests as four possible ways. It could be that your theology is very orthodox and adequate to proper Christian grammar, what scripture says about God and God's relation with human beings and the rest of the world. It is theologically adequate. And then it could be that that theological adequacy within the framework of the pastoral situation can also, using psychological grammar, become psychologically functional so that psychological functionality and theological adequacy will be the optimum that you're heading for. And we will look at that when we uh, look at the case study. But you could, if you're not careful, let theological adequacy become so entrenched as the mode you're operating in and not allow the social sciences, psychology, to question even some of the orthodoxy that you bring that you could land in a theological adequacy without psychological functionality, and you do not help the psychology of the religious believer and your pastoral or spiritual care may fail. Or you could do the obverse, that your psychology will be so clean and you're so headed to making sure that this person or the situation is fully psychologically functioning, that the theology will be so wishy-washy and so inadequate that even that person that you have brought to, in a sense, psychological fullness will begin to shake their head over the theological moves that you have made. I hear that and I say, I get it. But I think that the only way that for me as a reformed practical theologian can wield that method and avoid the kind of psychological dysfunction or theological inadequacy in pastoral situations is to go beyond bilingualism is to go beyond being adept at speaking theology fluently and speaking psychology fluently in the same way that you speak Spanish or English and never conflate the two. But you know which is your primary language. You know the language you dream in. And what I said at the beginning about God being anthropocentric, it means that my work requires me to hear from God about this person before me. And that is what makes me go beyond bilingualism and declare what my primary language is, even if I'm very, very bilingual, fluent in theology and psychology, but giving conceptual priority, more than conceptual priority, actual priority to the theological language. Let me put this in simple terms. If you're babysitting somebody's kid, you better follow instructions given by mama. You always come with what? You may have your ways about child rearing, but 
you follow mama's directions. And so for me to be able to move beyond bilingualism and declare what your primary language is, your primary language could be psychology, but you need to put it there. I am saying that for me, the primary language because of my belief in creation and because I want to hear what God is saying in this moment, theology then is primary. And this is the reason. All in pastoral situation, as I marry my theology and my psychology, and as I try to shoot for theological adequacy and psychological adequacy, and this may sound like I'm speaking from both sides of my mouth. I know because of what I believe is God's heart for people, that God would take psychological functionality any day over theological adequacy. God can take care of God's self. Taking care of the person or situation before me is primary to this God who says that we are the object of God's love and God is unwilling to distract God's self from us. So here is the case study from a spirited world. Um, I don't have it and I don't know if um, um, on the screen now is the kind of theological adequacy, theological inadequacy and the psychological functionality and how the uh, method works. But here is the case study that you heard. Um, or read about a leader and whether it is okay to get the ashes of the daughter and sacrifice it to the Orisha. And you heard the response from, I'm a Presbyterian minister as well. You heard the response from a Presbyterian minister. We would call that an attempt to move towards theological adequacy. We want to make sure that the move we make in caring for this person is theologically adequate in the sense that it goes in line with scripture. We know what scripture says about sacrifice to other gods, and we are not going to mess with that. But here is a question that makes me say, I would take psychological functionality over theological adequacy and believe that I am still being theologically adequate because of the overarching understanding of scripture about God and God's relationship with other human beings. So in short, I will call the pastor's response in that situation as theologically adequate, but psychologically dysfunctional because both people in that situation need their grief held and cared for. So what will make me care for the husband's grief in this moment and still gesture towards theological adequacy? I don't think it is my place to give an answer. And I'm hoping that you, from much of what I have said now, can give the answer to what the correct move might be. But if you ask me on the side, I will tell you that I'll probably help carry those ashes after I have worked with them through all the theological, not quite baggage, that they carry around what God is saying about gods and sacrifice to gods and all of that. So I will end here. And emphasize, aim for theological adequacy and psychological functionality but settle for no less than theologically inadequate, which it might look like, 
and psychological functionality because God is about humans. So I am done. And thank you for listening. I just want to thank you so much, um, Dr. Ekolatse, for joining us this morning and really delving into um, this reformed um, model of practical theology. And I just want to say how much um, I really appreciate you naming um, how practical theology is not simply a theory that we apply, um, that uh, we have a practice that informs theory, that, that comes back to refine practice. It is a practice-laden theory. Um, and um, our other speakers have from different religious traditions have also sort of have touched on that as well. Um, and, you know, I really appreciate you kind of delving into in depth, you know, how this very crucial question, the question we've been focused on this whole time in terms of how shall we pair theology with social sciences and and sort of exploring some of the um, some of the problems with previous um, approaches. Um, and doing such a, a really interesting and deep dive into the Chalcedonian approach, this recognition that Jesus is human and divine. They are inseparable, yet differentiated. They are, but, and also asymmetrical. And, and sort of what does that mean um, for, for caregiving? Um, and I really appreciate um, your sense that um, in practical theology, we really value psychological functionality over theologically theological adequacy because God is about the well-being of people. And so if we are about psychological functionality, we will also be about God and God's work, which is about bringing health and healness, healing and wholeness. So um, so thank you so much for that really rich talk. Um, we um, so there's there's a few options um, for our uh, breakout rooms today. Um, so I want to name that um, Dr. Akalatse provided a case study. Um, that case study was emailed to you um, previously, but it's also in the chat, I believe. Um, and so um, in our small groups, you are welcome to, um, to kind of delve into that case study if you would like to do that. Um, and um, I also want to name, um, so uh, you might notice that uh, there's only one speaker for the Christian tradition. Um, and given the sort of um, the privileged position of Christianity in the history of the field of pastoral and spiritual care, it was, I believe, a very wise, uh, a wise decision of uh of the board of this symposium not to have more than one speaker um, from the Christian tradition. And I want, I also, I want to hold this alongside um, that there's a lot of different ways and methods of correlating theology and the social sciences within Christianity. Um, and uh, Dr. Akalatse brought us through through one such method, um, and I am aware that there are many others. So uh, if there are people in this room who would like to sort of engage in that discussion, uh, continue that discussion together, I'll invite you all to remain in the main room. Um, and you can do that either by opting out of the breakout room or by leaving your breakout room. You could come back to their main room and kind of continue this this discussion um, as well. So you have a decision um, in terms of how you'd like to proceed with discussion on Christianity. Any questions before we break? Okay. Well, I wanna thank you again um, for, for being here and for such a rich presentation, um, really an honor. Thank you. So people were invited to go to the breakout rooms and they'll be trickling back if they want to come back. And it yeah, looks like they, I, looks like they I are. Saw the, the, but it went away before I could click. And yeah, people so are coming. I guess it means I stay here. Yep. Yeah, you stay here and, and the oh. co-host will stay here. Oh, and, okay. and everybody else is trickling back uh, to the main room here. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll let you take it from here.
And I should say, uh, Dr. Echo Latte, if you would, if you would prefer to be in a breakout room, that's completely, that's fine oh, as no. well. I, I'm you have that decision to follow, <laughs> to follow um, the discussion, to learn about other. This is where we learn about other modes of mm -hmm. pairing theology and psychology, right? Oh, this, yeah, this is that discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great to hear you, Esther. Uh, we exchanged uh, right messages. I, I came we back. Had not, we had not met. <laughs> I know, <laughs> so to speak. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And sorry about. I always have my notes on the screen, and I didn't know how to to read from the screen with sharing the screen. <laughs> oh. Okay. And I saw a few names that I think I knew, like Sally Youngest. Well, this is Chioma. Um, oh, yes, Chioma. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for, for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I am <laughs> fortunately driving, but I couldn't but want to hear this. And it makes so much sense. Of course, me coming mm -hmm. from the Catholic perspective, uh, All right. Oh, I saw Esther Mumbo hmm. from Kenya. Hmm. I'm watching people kind of come and go, so I'm just going to give it a minute. I know. <laughs> Help people figure out where yeah. they're, they're ending I up. Yeah. Hi, Carol. Welcome. Hi. I I was in a group that I said I'm a therapist and I wanted to go back and I didn't know how and somebody directed me. And then I saw a lot of my group show up and then we all ended back in the group. So that could be. I, I think the thing gave us only 46 seconds to return. I don't know how that happened, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it's my second time to return. And I don't know if those people wanted to return to or not. Okay, yeah. Sounds like there's a little bit of difficulty happening with this. Mm -hmm. I was um, in a conference in Korea and I just gave it up because Oh, you're stable now. Okay. Wow, there's a lot of... Hello, Esther. Okay. All right, Steve is saying, uh, okay. Hello, Esther. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Steve is telling me he thinks that the groups are stable now, so we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how this works. Um, so yes, this was the space to kind of um, further discussion on the relationship between the social sciences and theology. Of course, Esther, since you're here, um, if you would also like to bring the case study in, please don't hesitate, because um, I think it's a really beautiful example of, of this kind of inner relationship as well. Um, so um, yeah, I just want to open it up as I named um uh, Dr. Akolatse gave us a very, um, a really deep example um, in the Chalcedonian approach of this relationship, and um, and I'm also aware that um, that there there are other ways of valuing uh, those two disciplines and other approaches, and you spoke to some of them as well, uh, Dr. Akolatse, um, and, and one that I'm also aware of would be sort or sort of a more postmodern view. Um, particularly the one um, advanced by like uh, Carrie Doring writes about this in the practice of mm -hmm. pastoral care, where mm -hmm. um, she kind of draws on postmodern and social constructive approaches to knowledge in, in both psychology and religious studies and sort of positions uh, this relationship in light of broader goals of social justice, um, asking how kind of like social systems of oppression intersect with these two disciplines and intersect with like beliefs and values and practices 
Um, and she would say it's compatible with a, a, a dialogical method and also distinct. So it sort of both overlaps and distincts. And, and so I was, um, yeah, I was just wondering with uh, about other people and, and the ways and the methods and the approaches to kind of holding these two disciplines and, and where people are with that particular question. Yeah, I, I, I always thought that what postmodernism does is to sort of um, broaden the canvas. Mm -hmm. But there's a sense in which uh, that kind of integration is happening at the same time, but you're asking what other social factors impinge on the situation. Mm -hmm. So that even with a case study here, you know, uh, this is a post-colonial uh, uh, space in which the, the the gods of Africa come along with you in this new space and how much is post-colonialism, you know, and the impinging of Christianity on your traditional religions really mm -hmm. at work in this situation, mm -hmm. you know, so that you might be thinking you're a Catholic, Protestant, but the Orisha, the Condomble is still part of this. You know, so that the caring then has to embrace your arms have to be wider to look at the social structures that impinge on the situation. And I think that is what the postmodern approach does well and reminds us to 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 take care of. Hmm. Yeah. Uh Daniel, do you want to respond? Yes, I, I think uh <laughs> Your case study is very interesting to to make some comparisons also with other approaches. But what I want to say is that uh, it was interesting that you brought a study from the Caribbean. Yes, uh, <laughs> with with my family, I, I, we live nine years in Puerto Rico, and oh. in Cuba, I go every year to help in the training of chaplains. So the the this was very familiar. Uh, and uh, one thing I want to say is that your case study points to diversity within Christianity even. Mm -hmm. So to take into consideration, because for uh, Roman Catholics in Latin America and, and the Caribbean, uh, there is much more of um, openness, shall I say, to syncretism and yes. to the plurali plurality of views. Whereas for evangelicals and Protestants in general, uh, it's it's uh, very different. So mm -hmm. that is part of the larger context, right uh, there. And um, yeah, I don't want to say much more. Uh, there are other voices probably, but it's um, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's very helpful actually to remind us that there is the the social cultural context here and the plurality within our traditions. Mm -hmm. That condition somehow relate to the methodology mm -hmm. then uh, and the epistemological question of how we integrate, which is your right. Point. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. And, and, and how to do it so that God is God of both these people, you know, and not just one, you know, be, be, because the impression is that one is right and one is wrong. So that you have a, a, a divided God <laughs> whom these two people name as one. So it's it's not that easy to, to move in and out. Yeah. I think someone, Esther's hand is up, I think. Yes, Esther, please. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Uh, my name mm -hmm. for for the presentation. Mm -hmm. I was intrigued with uh, the case study, but first of all, to 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 also say that all theology is practical theology. I, I take that I I argue that these villages of that and that and that systematics, wherever, are villages that partition even the student. When you are teaching the student, they don't know when to think about. Uh, pastoral theology or practical theology and Bible, that, that we haven't created a space where 
that is a there's a way in which they can come out as whole with all the villages in which they study. But coming back to to your case study, I agree with uh, Daniel that uh, it brings out the issues around diversity and plurality, mm -hmm. and then wonder what aspect does colonialism play? Because mm -hmm. the answer that is given here uh, is, for me, just brings back the reaction uh, 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 that some of the traditions now argue that was colonialism mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the way there was missionary and colonial imperial against the African culture, mm -hmm. especially in some traditions, which it was all evil. Mm -hmm. But we do know that there are people who are tortured by this kind of thing, really tortured, that even when you say it is all superstitious, it's possible they'll go in the night and do it mm -hmm. because of the way in which they struggle. So we are, we are in the postmodern space, but many of our traditions from where I sit still hold on to a lot of colonial baggage uh, uh, that continues to influence the people. So in Kenya, you have lots of people from the mainline traditions, yours and mine included, going back, saying that you threw away these traditions, but they were important and trying to oscillate between the two so that mm -hmm. some people you find they'll be in one uh, maybe in the morning and in the evening they are doing something mm -hmm. else and they don't see the contradiction. So it is not either or, mm -hmm. it is both, both and. and. Both and, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. And, and, and that is where, in a sense, we, we ask how scripture um, sheds light on the situation and the situation sheds light on scripture. Because even if you talked about God and the gods, where the colonialism comes for me is whether the way colonial gaze framed the gods for us in Africa was not from the their understanding of the Greek or Roman pantheon. And whether when we say God and gods, we are speaking the way they did. And then to 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 say, um, you, you know, in Africa, we would say if a god misbehaves, we can show it from which tree it was cut. Yes. In other words, we even have limits placed on these gods. So can I use that? That knowledge that I have of African spaces and how they even talk about their gods, you know, to say the same thing that Paul says, if you go to dinner, don't be checking where the, the, the beef came from. Yes? Eat. Because <laughs> these gods are not gods. Can I use those two moments? One African, one from scripture, because we're trying to transcend syncretism, to speak into the situation and let them go have their festival. then the question becomes how preaching is pastoral care. What am I as minister of the gospel saying in church so that it necessitates someone going for care at night somewhere else? So it looks at the colonial situation, but also says, how do I care for this person as God's own? If what I'm saying makes any sense. So we are trying to be theologically adequate within the psychological, you know, functionality. And it looks like people are coming. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, one wonders whether syncretism could be looked at positively than the ways in which it is looked at very negatively while. Is syncretism can be looked at in a different way? Yes. I, I think that it was all over scripture itself. 
and for me, the final question is, does it free for joyful living? Because anything you're hiding doesn't free you. Does it free for joyful living? Or does it bind me further? You can look at my book for freedom or bondage, a critique of African pastoral practices and see if it will help. Does it free for joyful living? You know? When I have my young festival and say, and, and, and thank the gods for, for a good harvest. I what am I doing? Somebody else yeah. is speaking. Miss, Miss Carol. Right. Uh, yes. I, apologize. I apologize for interrupting. I just want to note, um, everybody's back from the breakout rooms. You're, uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break, even though it me means we'll be a little bit behind schedule. You're welcome to stay here and continue to, to chat if you'd like. Um, but we are going to take a 10 minute break and then we'll start Islam at 940. I will also put this in the chat, but thank you so much to everyone for this really rich discussion. I truly wish we could just continue <laughs> to talk about all of this. It's so interesting. Um, but Really, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So thank we'll you. take a break until yeah. 940. Thank you. Uh, hello, Esther, since you, since you sta uh, uh, stayed, this is so interesting. You know, in 1898, the 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 colonial issue that was raised by the, the other <laughs> sister Esther uh, in Ghana, 1988, 1989, uh, 98, uh, United States won the war against Spain, and then the missionaries st started going to to Latin America. Uh, I mean, Protestant and evangelical churches. So before that, there were there was this Catholicism, whether it was more or less in pure form or in syncret syncretism mm -hmm. but uh, so uh, it's very interesting what happened the correlation between the imperial uh, colonial impulse of um, well first England frankly <laughs> Britain and then the United States and and the establishment of these churches that were not of course uh, intent on supporting explicitly consciously mm -hmm colonialism, but in practice, some of that happened. So what we have then, and there's this animosity even between Christian traditions already because the, the Protestants and Evangelicals that went, went there say, oh no, we are the true Christians, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, well, anyway, so this is also part of the background. That's what I found mm -hmm. your your is so interesting, because Santeria is actually very much alive in Cuba, in Puerto Rico, in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and sort of uh, connected with uh, forms of Christianity. Yes. And there was a whole internal conversation and conflict there mm -hmm. that somehow your case study in a micro way illustrates so here in spiritual care have the wonderful opportunity to do something yes for the sake of what with compassion yes <laughs> and just that. but something for healing even if it is a little bit but it counts right it yes. counts so yes. I'm, and, and I'm, I have to uh, own that um, in end of June at the Yale Edinburgh Conference on World Christianity, I responded to Carlos Olandi. Oh, oh, he was he yeah, was my so student. He brought, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah he so, was my student so told, in Puerto Rico. <laughs> oh, great! I'll tell him. Yeah. So this was the case study that we 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 used for that address because it was something uh, about the spirit, something. Anyway. Yeah, so I'll tell him because I asked him to use it again here. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is so fascinating, the connection here. <laughs> oh, somebody, George, wants to ask two questions. Yeah, yes. am I audible? Can I raise the questions to you? Yes. May what I do you say? Am I, uh, may I ask the questions now? Okay. Yeah, 
uh, two questions, but I enjoyed your uh, lecture, although I missed the first part of that because I'm also a teacher and learner of pastoral theology. I'm ah. teaching exactly what you are already shared, but it's very interesting to hear that uh, beyond bilingualism, in that you said about theology as a primal speech. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you see that in the context of a person or a community which doesn't necessarily believe in the existence of God? Um, uh, number one. Number two, uh, in the hermeneutical uh, approach, you <laughs> mentioned about uh, you know, the interpretation. Um, you know, uh, the, the, you know, there is a lot of subjectivity in what we call hermeneutics. You know, you you interpret the Bible from your context or mm -hmm. from your background. So, how do you how do you respond to these two questions quickly? If, okay. If the, the, the yeah. Okay. Yes. The first one. I mean, in my notes um, here, this is so I can boldly declare that what is my preferred language in this attempt to use theology as primal speech because framed within a generous orthodoxy, an orthodoxy in its Pentecostalness that is open to all languages that allows everyone to be heard by God and God to hear everyone, in that it is willing, psychology is willing to be co-opted a theology is willing to be co-opted and to serve psychology in aid of the human for whom God has refused to leave the world alone. And here is your answer. Additionally, the natal cry of all humans is towards transcendence. First, it is mama, but framed psychosocially, if you think Erickson, that transcendence, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. is ultimately the real, no matter how you name it. We might say we are spiritual, but we are not religious. The, the, mm -hmm. There is something that cries, is always exocentric. So whatever that exocentricity is, is what, in a sense, in my Christian parlance, I call God. Mm -hmm. So so it doesn't matter whether you believe or not, there is the, the, the human's movement towards transcendence and to exocentricity, so that the ego centers. Mm -hmm. And then the other question about hermeneutics, if you remember what I said about what practical theology is, that it is not just correlational, but mm -hmm. critical. And then I'm saying that with the hermeneutics, we also uh, approach it with the hermeneutics of suspicion and ask mm -hmm. whether uh, we let the normative text run roughshod over other texts without mm -hmm. letting the other text have a certain mm -hmm. you know, way to critique Mm -hmm. So you have to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. You have to be able to let social sciences then, you know, mm -hmm. the situation, mm -hmm. let scripture, you know, mm -hmm. uh, scatter a little and regroup. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I think we learned mm -hmm. that from Jesus. He did that all the yeah. time. That's right. Yeah. Jesus himself was not a Christian. Yes. Yeah, that's what I tell my <laughs> He was students. a Jewish you know, boy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So I mean, uh, some of the traditions which say that you need to convert. You know, no, some of the no. uh, evangelical God traditions, we say that God. we need to convert to Christianity. Mm -hmm. God can speak I said you must convert you Jesus to. Christ. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I did want yes, to Carol. say something really quick because um, I was intrigued because I've been a licensed marriage and family therapist trained at a pastoral care center. And then I've also evangelical in my background. And uh, I did some spiritual direction and that transcendence piece is what's helped me. Um, the first thing that jumped out to me is she asked, what should I do? Putting the authority outside of herself and the transcendence, I think, is the Holy Spirit and that she had a healthy blended family. I'd go back to her heart and rather than me be the authority or and it's that spiritual thing, what leads to freedom and what leads to oppression that I learned from the Catholics, because she might have that, to be free to keep a good bond with her ex-husband, free to respond to his pain, you know, I think would be the transcendent. Mm -hmm. And I think 
for me, even in my calling, it's reconciliation with each other and with God. Because if you aren't reconciling well with each other, you may have a wrong view of God, <laughs> you know? So that's just what I wanted to, I like that you pointed out the freedom and the transcendence and to bring in the Holy Spirit. It does speak truth to our hearts, in my opinion. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Thank Esther. You. Um, we're going to we're going to need to move on. Unfortunately, this is such yes, an interesting please. discussion. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Um, okay, so we are moving uh, moving on to uh, to Islam, um, and uh, I am honored to in to introduce today uh, Dr. Nazila Iskandarova. Um, she is the practicum director of supervised psycho spiritual education and the Assistant Professor of Islamic Spiritual Care at Emmanuel College of Victoria University and the University of Toronto. Um, she integrates clinical practice, research, supervision, and teaching. And she is also a leading voice in Islamic practical theology and spiritual care, while remaining committed to interfaith reflection and collaboration. So thank you for being here, Dr. Iskandarova, and we look forward to hearing from you. Okay, thank you so much. I really very uh, great honor to be with you today, and uh, my great thanks to Daniel, Professor Sh Daniel Shipani, and uh, uh, Leah to you as well for taking care, and everyone who who really put the labor to put uh, this conference together, this international conference together. Um, and thank you for a nice introduction as well. And I'm going to talk about the Islamic spiritual care at the intersection of Islamic psychotherapy, psychology, and Islamic theology. Uh, as Leah, you mentioned, uh, I am a big uh, fan of Islamic practical theology. It's something a new and evolving field. And uh, I locate Islamic spiritual care, psychotherapy, Islamic social work, definitely at uh, the intersection of uh, social sciences, and Islamic uh, practical theology as well. I'm going to share my screen. Um, so let me put a full view of my screen. Okay, Islamic uh, spiritual care and psychotherapy as the intersection of theology and social sciences. So the main objectives of my presentation today is to look at the historical context of Islamic spiritual care and psychotherapy and differentiates the scope of practices within the field of Islamic spiritual care and Islamic psychotherapy. Uh, and the, one of the questions I am going to reflect today on is how do these understandings and definitions that I'm going to present help practitioners in the Islamic spiritual care and Islamic psychotherapy in their professional role? Uh, by introducing Islamic psychotherapy today, uh, I have a reason to do so, because I'm coming from the Canadian context where uh, many spiritual caregivers, including Muslim spiritual caregivers, uh, are psychotherapists, registered psychotherapists, or the training allows them to practice within the field of spiritual care and also psychotherapy as well. In this respect, these new changes that uh, became in effect in 2013 in Canada with the implementation of College of Registered Psychotherapists, we see its impact in our field, um, Islamic spiritual care and evolving field of Islamic psychotherapy as well. So I will start with Islamic spiritual care first. Uh, uh, many uh, understand Islamic spiritual care not only as a faith-based practice, but also a clinical practice, especially in Canada. This makes Muslim spiritual care giver, the givers and the kind of philosophical, theoretical approach different from those who come from faith-based understanding. Let's say that some Muslim spiritual care givers who have the training in spiritual care in United States or Europe, they might understand Islamic spiritual care only as a faith-based practice. Uh, but in Canada, Muslim spiritual caregivers are trained in clinical settings and they understand, their understanding of spiritual care is not only a faith-based, but also is a clinical practice as well. 
we see Islamic spiritual care as an independent discipline. And it is definitely related to other forms of Islamic spiritual care giving uh, practices such as Islamic education, preaching, theology, and ethics. And now we can also add to these Islamic psychology and Islamic psychotherapy. The main goal of Islamic spiritual care is healing, sustaining, and guiding clients. However, in the Canadian context, Muslim spiritual caregivers understand Islamic spiritual care as a um, Islamic psychotherapy from Islamic psychotherapy perspective too, especially with the implementation of CRPO, College of Registered Psychotherapists in uh, in 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 Canada in Ontario. So what CRPO uh, presents us in terms of Islamic or in, in terms of uh, psychotherapy is that psychotherapy is a profession where we do assess and um, and treat. Uh, mental health problems, behavioral problems, and cognitive problems by using one of the or one of the psychotherapy modalities. So in this uh, in this case, there is integ uh, integrative approach to spiritual care in Canada. We also call it spiritually integrated uh, psychotherapy or spiritual care as well. So we see like uh, we have diverse models and techniques to support Muslim clients. And these models and techniques not only come from the Islamic tradition, but it also comes from the social sciences approach as well. Would like uh, to give you some historical context. Uh, we Muslims understand that spiritual care is not a new practice uh, that we, um, we practice today. Islamic uh, spiritual care has roots in the prophetic tradition. We call it nasiha. Nasiha can also be translated as uh, uh, advice giving, information giving, and counseling. And the uh, Muslim spiritual caregivers have been uh, known as physicians of the soul. And in this sense, even when we talk about Islamic psychotherapy and psychology, we see that these fields also has deep roots in Islamic tradition because we have concepts such as ilaj al-nafs or um, ilaj al-nafs uh, is translated into English as uh, uh, treatment or, uh, or cure of the soul. And they were known as experts in the patient uh, wounded by kind of scene or mental or emotional and physical problems. So I would like to uh, invite you to reflect on kind of patient wounded by sin. So uh, we also pay attention to kind of how certain behaviors and certain diseases can affect the soul and how certain uh, diseases of the soul can affect uh, the person from physical and psychological perspectives. Uh, there is also a tradition of, uh, in Islamic tradition, Fuqaha al-Badan, translated into English as physicians, kind of uh, those who treated the body. But uh, it's so interesting is that during Mughal time, some imams they were also trained in medicine. And the Imam Shafi, which is, uh, who is one of the greatest scholars of the, in the Islamic tradition, introduced certain concepts saying that uh, not only uh, scholars, but ordinary people also need to understand how important it is to be trained in basic uh, science of uh, medicine. Muslims, uh, we know that built major hospitals in the Middle East, in India, and uh, in Iran, in uh, Anatolia. And what is interesting is that in these major hospitals uh, built by Muslims, spiritual care was part of the care for the uh, patients. And many Muslim physicians, they were also trained how to provide spiritual care to the patients. And the majority of these uh, hospitals were funded through Beit al Mal, the, simply by the government, but they were also private hospitals. So that means that they were funded by individual, uh, by uh, rich individuals who supported these hospitals greatly and their care as these hospitals were free. And the uh, Islamic spiritual care was provided in different kinds of settings. For example, Fazlur Rahman, one of the great scholars of our time, he passed away. Uh, 
uh, and he has very good book, Hells and Medicine in Islamic Tradition, where he talks about the spiritual care and the roots, roots of spiritual care provided in different settings, also in the prisons. And the specific goals of the spiritual care in medieval times in prison settings was dawah, kind of calling to Islam, nasiha, and again, advice giving, information giving. Sometimes they practice rubia, rubia kind of very uh, exorcism that we can see in Roman Catholic tradition, and also Jum'ah prayer, including reading the Quran and the uh, prayers to the patient or those in the prison settings as well. Um, there was a tradition and the concept in the Sufi psychology, Sufi tradition, uh, some uh, Muslim spiritual caregivers, they use, they use this concept of taskiyat al-nafs, or purification of the soul, and that soul only comes from the prophetic tradition, but it was Sufis who kind of elaborated and established a model and established a whole uh, kind of uh, practice uh, in, in Islamic tradition. There were major principles of uh, Taskiyat al-Nafs, the concept of Taskiyat al-Nafs. So one of them was Tarbiya. Tarbiya was understood as a process of developing individual potential through guiding and nurturing. And the second principle was Ta'alim, that meant there's a process of gaining knowledge and also Ta'adib again, uh, kind of uh, paying attention how we live our life, including how we kind of uh, uh, learn and practice moral manners, not only in the individual life, but also in community setting, because majority of uh, Muslims see and the so uh, they like not only at the uh, center of uh, individual lifestyle, but also at the center of the collectivistic uh, lifestyle. So again, Gilad Ray and Ali and Patterson in the uh, important book talks about the traditional spiritual care goals, uh, even today, kind of ta'lim, tarbiya, and adab. We see many Muslim spiritual caregivers still kind of practicing this. Uh, and in my book in 2005, I did talk about the um, additional layers of uh, the meaning, purpose, and hope that we uh, elaborate and examine with patients, with our clients in Islamic spiritual care. And that is simply examining uh, life's three purposes, one of them is to inhabit to inhabit the earth and to be Khalifa. Khalifa kind of in Islamic tradition meant that we are the representatives of God on earth and how we kind of ethically, morally kind of uh, 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 implement the role of uh, being representatives of God on earth in our lifestyle, in community, and kind of taking the names of Allah, such as kind, compassionate, and merciful God, and how we represent all these attributes of God on earth. And second uh, uh, purpose of the, uh, the uh, of life as Muslims see it is to worship God. And again, it has very deep roots in the Quranic tradition and uh, being again representatives uh, of God on earth. And uh, we see kind of the role of the Muslim spiritual caregivers uh, is to help clients uh, to experience and uh, as a process uh, without feeling guilt in order to achieve good mental and spiritual health through natural balance within the individual's um, the lifestyle and also collectivistic lifestyle as well. Now I would like you to uh, reflect on Islamic psychotherapy. Uh, definitely still today, we don't have any consensus on the definition of Islamic psychotherapy and counseling. And the South African Muslim scholar Shabnam Duramsi invites us to think if we call Islamic psychotherapy Islamic because Muslims practices, Muslim practitioners practices, or if we have a very solid theological, theoretical, and uh, um, integrative approach to Islamic uh, psychotherapy, including uh, locating psychology at the intersection of theology and uh, Islamic uh, uh, psychology. Uh, my understanding, and I agree with Islam uh, Rasul, another great uh, uh, scholar in the field, Islamic psychotherapy addresses not only emotional and mental health problems, but also provides a form of spiritual healing through 
self purifications that we uh, presented as taskia tal nafs and therapy of repentance and educates a client in Islamic faith and Islamic jurisprudence. Um, and then I would like to give another quote from Abdullah Rothman and Coyle, and they uh, define Islamic psychotherapy as uh, any psychotherapy that aims to be truly Islamic and take Islamic understanding of the person as its foundation be will be located outside Western secular models of psychotherapy in fundamental ways. In this way, Abdullah Rahman and uh, other Muslim uh, psychotherapists and psychologists have been inspired by Malik Badri, uh, another great Muslim uh, psychologist who uh, critically evaluated Western psycho psychologists, Western psychotherapy from uh, uh, oppressive colonial perspective and criticized uh, a certain notion in the Western secular models of psychology and psychotherapy. Why I'm talking about psychotherapy, Islamic psychotherapy, when I present Islamic spiritual care, as I say that in Canada, Muslim, many Muslim spiritual caregivers also practice Islamic psychotherapy with the clients um, in, in, in private settings and also in hospitals and in different settings, including prison and long-term care settings as well. So coming back to Islamic spiritual care and spiritual psychotherapy, definitely from the name we see that it centers the soul or the treatment of the soul at the practice, at the heart of the practice of spiritual care and in Islamic psychotherapy. One of the things I would like you to think about it is that it would be very odd not to speak about the soul and spirit and God uh, in Islamic spiritual care and uh, Islamic psychotherapy, simply because our clients, Muslim clients, expect us to kind of uh, provide something different that secular psychotherapy, secular psychologists um, uh, provide. In this setting, in this kind of setting, we kind of take the study of souls uh, seriously. And Aisha Us in her book, Psychology from the Islamic Perspective, says that the study of the soul means that we examine behavior, emotions, mental processes from the concept of soul and the spirit, because we take into uh, consideration of the seen and unseen aspects that influence these elements. And there then another scholar Wahab in, in, in the book, An Introduction to Islamic Psychology, talks about the Islamic uh, uh, understanding of the soul, simply meaning that the study of the manifestation of God in nature as reflected in behavioral patterns of all living and all non-living organisms in all walks of their lives using the Islamic paradigms. And then uh, Siddiqui and Malik examine um, these concepts from the study of persons who have complete surrender, submission, and obey the laws of God. So we can go on and examine all these concepts, but we see that the concepts of soul, spirit, and God, and also uh, humans' relationship to God and humans' uh, kind of different uh, elements, including soul, mind, body, all are related to the Islamic theology uh, and the Islamic psychology deeply. So the, I always tell that all these definitions might be very confusing, uh, might be very broad and too expensive. And there's also danger because sometimes we can uh, lose the scope of practice, we can lose uh, um, our focus, and uh, we can go to different directions if we don't have a good understanding in the, of Islamic um, theology and Islamic psychology and also social sciences. In this respect, my approach is very, very integrative. And I, will, I always say that we cannot fully practice Islamic spiritual care and Islamic psychotherapy if we don't have a good training in Islamic psychotherapy. And again, coming back to Shabnam Dharamsi's question and reflection, saying that we call Islamic psychotherapy simply because uh, Muslims, Muslim practitioners do this or we uh, have really serious approach 
and serious understanding of all these concepts at the intersection of social sciences and Islamic practical, Islamic theology. So in this sense, in uh, I have been uh, influenced uh, and I'm very open to talk about this uh, by Islam, by Christian practical theology. And uh, very, thank you very much, Esther, by talking about the Reformed Christian practical theology. And I have been influenced by Paul Tillich and also Tracy and other um, scholars in the Christian practical theology, including my own supervisor and uh, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Tom O'Connor in Canada. So my approach is that when we introduce all these concepts, we need to be very specific. And in order to be specific, again, we need to be very well grounded in Islamic uh, practical theology. Uh, and the, I see Islamic practical theology, again, from the perspective of correlational approach. And again, as Esther presented, uh, we also question this in Islamic practical theology, if correlational approach to spiritual care and psychotherapy in Islam um, enough, or we need to go beyond correlational approach. And in this uh, respect, kind of uh, uh, my approach is very integrative. And uh, again, I'm coming from the hermeneutical suspicion perspective. Uh, another uh, kind of reflection would be that I always avoid uh, of any definition that is ideological because we need to take into, um, uh, uh, into account the professional liabilities and professional responsibilities, accountabilities in the field and also ethics when we become very uh, ideological. And uh, I would like to situate again psychotherapy and spiritual care within an Islamic tradition of knowledge. However, uh, these days we also see different approaches simply because Islamic spiritual care and Islamic psychotherapy has all, have always uh, been influenced not only by the Islamic tradition, but also by other traditions, including in Christian tradition, Jewish tradition, and Buddhist traditions as well. Um, and uh, I think I don't have much time, but uh, uh, I I kind of stop here. And the overall question I have uh, for you to think about it when we go to small groups is that how do Islamic theological doctrines and spiritual practices influence patterns of souls and behaviors in uh, Islamic spiritual care and in Islamic psychotherapy? Thank you so much and looking forward for fruitful discussion in our small groups. I wanna thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Iskandarova for your really insightful foray into both is Islamic spiritual care and Islamic psychotherapy and the overlap that we need to sort of see that, that we need to see these as interrelated and overlapping. Um, and particularly that um, Islamic spiritual care in Canada is, is faith-based and is, um, is clinical and that spiritual caregivers practice Islamic psychotherapy. And that said that, um, while there's no consensus about the definition of Islamic psychotherapy, that it does, we, we do know it addresses not only emotional and mental health problems, but also spiritual, provides spiritual healing. Um, and that um, it's really looking at behavior and emotional processes through the lens of the soul, through the manifestation of God in nature, through Islamic scripture, reason, and empirical evidence. Um, and I really appreciate uh, your additions and contributions, um, recognizing um, a, an evolving definition that it need not be, should not be ideological and should be uh, situated within the Islamic tradition of knowledge and professional and theoretical. So thank you so much. Really appreciate uh, your talk. Um, so, uh, and our next speaker um, on, uh, in terms of Islam, will be, um, I am honored to introduce Dr. Mahmoud Abdallah, who is a researcher at the Center for Islamic Theology in the University of Tübingen, Germany. His main areas of interest and involvement include Islamic practical theology and pastoral care, theology of coexistence, interreligious dialogue, 
Muslim religious community in a pluralistic society, and also state and religion in Islam. Um, Dr. Abdullah has worked on various research projects, published many things, and been a visiting lecturer kind of all over the globe. Um, and his current research focuses on the genealogy and ethics of Islamic pastoral care. Um, so we're honored to have you here and welcome Dr. Abdullah. Thank you very much, Professor Thomas, for the very friendly introduction. And thank you, Dan, and everybody for the invitation. I'm very glad and very happy to be here and to share my research and my ideas with you. Let me, me as a first, share with you my presentation. <clears throat> so, As you see, I took uh, a part of our symposium in the title of my uh, contribution today. I'd like to, uh, to speak about why Islam tradition is Islamic spiritual care and especially about the perspective in the cooperation with another disciplinary. Um, I will not try just to make a description of Islamic pastoral care, but I'm trying to discuss with you some ideas about the perspective of this in Islamic tradition, special maybe very new field as a research subject. Uh, we have maybe in Germany as a background, maybe it's interesting for you to know, we have in Germany a master degree in Islamic pastoral care and social works. And it's the only one in the German speaking uh, countries until now. And I'm researching and working on this field. I like to uh, introduce three parts of my contribution. The first part, I will speak maybe a little about the relationship between religion and health in Islam. In the second part, I will speak about the Islamic pastoral care and the theological foundation. How can we found arguments for the new field, especially in the German speaking countries and German context. And we'll show you at this part special case of this approaches. And in the third part, I will discuss about the cooperation with another fields in the academic field. But let me be, start my presentation with the three examples from the praxis. I will not comment all of this, but maybe it's interesting to know how is the practice world in Germany. In the first one, we have a patient with women, very modern and very religious women. And she had a problem with her son. This is from the clinic. With her son, he doesn't come to visit here because he is leaving and walking 400 kilometers far away from here. And she was not interested in pastoral care. She didn't like Quran recitation on prayers on anything. But the he gave us tries many times, and at the end, she decided together to make in a kind of sohba. It is like Islamic songs together, and the lady was very happy with this. Second example, we have a 50 years old refugee from Turkey. He's Muslim. The kid gave us enter to the room and started with "Assalamu alaikum." It is the Islamic greeting. And the patient answered very quickly, default. It's in Turkey, like in German, in English, maybe go away, go out. So he gave us then to give up and try to find out what's the problem. And in the discussion about the practice, he, the conclusion of the caregivers, he said, never again to, to say the Islamic greeting directly, stay away from any nationality, religion, and language. So it's a question, what can we still call it Islamic Pasakia? The last example is this 55 years old man, is Alawit. The caregiver is Sunni, is Muslim Sunni. And he knows that the patient is Alawit and he started to speak with him about football, about politics and social works. And the conclusion of caregivers is attention to ones on borders and friendly understanding conversation. 
I don't like to comment the cases because I published it 2016 and 19, and I can send more information to it. If we see three cases, we will ask me the first point, what is the Islamic prosakia? The relationship between religion and health, uh, Dr. Nazila mentioned it in, in, in many times, in many speakings, but you see that the Islamic understanding of body and soul as a unity, unity who also combines support and influence each other is a characterizes Islamic medicine, ethic, and philosophy. Ethics are seen as a kind of medicine of soul. For example, from Adamson. The spiritual care in Islam represents a com combination of medicine, ethic, and theology, and requires an interdisciplinary approaches and interpersonal cooperation in order to succeed. Medical people used a medicine in philosophical and ethical vocabulary and used vocabulary in philosophical and medicine vocabulary. If we look to the Quran about this relationship, we'll find the Quran can discuss on illness only concerns the soul, the mind, or the heart, as well as a neurotic illness, such as a sadness, for example. For this healing of such illnesses, the Quran constantly points out spirituality as a mean of giving inner peace and thus drawing attention to the connection between spirituality and coping with hardships. In the Prophet tradition, we will find many chapters in the main box of the tradition of the Prophet with the name of Kitab al-Tib, chapters of medicine, saying that promise the sick that their prayers of supplication will be accepted, their sin forgiven, and so on, already shows their spiritual character. That means in the Islamic tradition, a strict division of health and religion, of body and soul, is hardly to be found. Dr. Nazir mentioned uh, the discussion in the tradition, and we found so, uh, fiqh al-abdan, this medicine of bodies, or the law of bodies. Some people like al-Balkhi from the third century, 19th, 9th century, uh, he mentioned that people are suffering, soul suffering has two ways to fight with suffering. For coping, one have to look at himself for spirituality, and the second one, he needs from outside some people, some friends and communities to support him in this way. This tradition, not some historical to say, we have to take into account that Islam is the only high religion that already carries the word it heals in its title, and such has made this central concept the foundation of the world view and attitude towards life. SLM, Salam, means well-being in all around in body, soul, and spirit, healing. And the reflexive of this is Salam. Now coming what is which is still open. What is the Islamic pastor care? I don't like to give a definition. We have many understanding of this, as uh, Dr. Nazira mentioned. But in the German context, Islamic pastoral care is often identified with certain pastoral care assistance and education courses that have been developed in recent decades to accompany people of Muslim faith in their distress. Quickly, this offers gained attention and as a result, the discussion about the professionalization and the institutionalization of the new professor field of this. One of this important discussion is about the theologian approach and background of the Islamic pastoral care. I tried to make a globalization of theological approaches of Islamic pastoral care, my book from 2022, and we can speak from four approaches. A virtual oriented approach, a systematic theological approach, ritual-based approaches, and pragmatic historical approaches. In a way, every one of these approaches has a consequence for the practice and the concept 
for dealing with people. But the field still open to design. I like maybe to introduce one of these approaches more for you, because for in my opinion, it's one of the important approaches in the field. And it's about the concept of birr in Islam. In English, we will be translated like a bitty. And I like to introduce it on the surah number two, 177. If you look to the translation, pity, Arabic bear, doesn't lie in turning your face to east or west. Pity is believing in God, last day, and so on. And to support people, maybe Zwani and patience in any ways. If we look to this, Start for the verse, we will see bears, bear is not this, but it is. That means it's correcting one of, and miss, there is a misunderstanding maybe in the first Muslim society about bear, about religion, to think it is in prayer, to pray all the time. But he corrected him, it's not to look as and west, but it is important to support people. So bear as a concept for Pasakia can walk by the traditional borders of peace by pointing out many ways to make peace in mind possible. As you look in the first in the verse, some people find inner peace in belief in God, other reach his commitment through financial security, yet others seek security in family and friends, and last find comfort in patience. The interactive, interpersonal relationship in the concept of pity offers an immediate point of reference to considering pastoral care as a religion, relational work. Similar to acting according to birth, interactive relationship express more than a, a relation to or being able to with people and their problem. It also associates trust and familiarity with their needs. And this is understanding of Islamic pastoral care, just it's not just to be with them. Maybe I would like to point out four points or aspects of pas, uh, of concept of prayer, why it's a very important theological approaches for Islamic pastoral care, especially two for the interreligious cooperation. The first one, it focus on the interpersonal relationship and social supports and giving it a framework, namely the faith and the belief in God. Secondly, it explains a misunderstanding among the people at the first time. It's not only prayer, but you have to be there for the people. Similar misunderstanding need to be discussed in today's practice of pastor care. It is a concept that is well known in other culture and religions, and such lays the foundation for a contemporary Basraki and plural society. The misunderstanding explains that people know already the concept of prayer, but misinterpreted it, and the Quran corrected the way to be beaten. And last one, it speaks of a very central aspect in the practice of pastoral care, namely patience, which has an own conception in Islam. And it will be a point to discuss how can we explain it today. For the interreligious cooperation, the bare concept is very known from the Islamic perspective is another scripture. If we speak from the Islam, I showed you Surah number two, verse 177, that explaining the correct way to be bitty in Islam. In the same surah, verse number 40, Quran confirmed the understanding of bitty in Jewish tradition. That this is the correct way to be bitty, but you have to do more of that. Not only to ask some people to do it, you have to do it by yourself too. In the Christianity, surah number 19 describes Jesus as a bitty. Somebody maybe can Arabic. In the all of this, what Jesus did was beat one of the very important one 
and the last description of pity in this context in Surah number uh, of Jesus in Surah number 19. That means we will find in this concept too some backgrounds for interreligious pastoral care. If we look to the tradition, because we, if we speak from practical theology, it's interesting to, to know how was the practice. It's only theoretical background or that we can find some practice in the Islamic history. So this is my next point. Theological background, the concept of waqf foundation. We know that Islam now has a very rich full history of foundations, but it's famous for schools, for something like this. Let me introduce you three foundations that are very similar to practical theology today. The first one, foundation for the intended comfort of patients, namely saving the patient. It's like a pastor care today. The idea of this foundation is that the bed for people who so working in hospitals by people in the end of the life and stay behind the wall and speak positively about these patients that he can listen to him but don't see him. And he can think he is getting better and can be soon be well. The second foundation for needs married couples in the Islamic tradition, families have a big role in the relationship between peoples. And if men and women have a problem and dispute with each other, the foundation can keep them at, for some days to discuss with another people with the same problems and to become down because if they go to the family, it will be the problem can be bigger. Foundation for servant in needs. And all of these things show us that from the beginning, there is a culture of care in the Islamic civilization. And this care, on pastoral care especially, doesn't mean only visiting for ill people, for patients. It doesn't only spirituality, but it means also financial support, social work, relation to the friends and to the family. If we have this background, the traditional foundation Maybe we can go together to the last part of the presentation about the interreligious and interdisciplinary cooperation. How it looks like for Islamic pastoral care. I think the question, the important question is what is the Islamic practical theology? For the Islamic discipline, therefore, the question arises as to its self understanding and subject matter. Its theory of sciences as well as an interdisciplinary cooperation and relationship to another fields. The term practica practice is associated with a multi understanding in the Islamic tradition. Practice as a pedagogical, theological field of action and applications. Practice as a synonym for the coherent practicing of religious norms in the form of rituals, ideals, commitment, and prohibitions, and practice as a lived religion and contract to the doctrine of norms and ethics. However, practice is so much more than an opposite of norm and theory. As a collective term for the diversity of lived religion, or normally defined as a correct segregation for the, of religious practice. It's important to ask which methods and approaches in the teaching of religious practice should be identified and developed in the Islamic discipline. To answer this question, this is important to, to ask about the determination of relationship to other Islamic theological fields and other human fields and even to other Christian fields. What is the relationship between Islamic practical theology and another Islamic studies like Quran studies or the Islamic law or the traditions, the studies of tradition of the Prophet? What is the relationship between them? And what is the relationship 
between to to the another is islamic theology in a theology in the position to develop its own forms and conception of its practical theology can it lead go out of the christian conception in the sense that is not imitative but defines it as a further path to practical wisdom which together with the christian traditions meets the challenges of the secular society for example you have in germany to develop a new master degree of islamic pastor care and we decided to do it uh, similar to the evangelic and protestant system and the protestant way we have to make a practice in the clinic and should pay it but the universities don't have the money to pay a practice can we decide for another way to make our curricula of teaching or if if you apply for founding can do you have a chance to apply for founding if you don't have the similar way for understanding of practical theology maybe it's interesting to ask with the practical theology in the christianity and another traditions together if we be need to think new about the understanding of practical theology i know a practical theology is a Christian term started to, to, to have a profile with Schleiermacher, maybe, but it's still 200 years old. We have a new context, a new participations, a new challenges, a new understanding of religion too. Maybe it's a collective job for all of religions together to think about it. Especially, it's important, the relationship to the lived religion because as you know, in the Islamic tradition, like Abdel al Jabri said sometimes, I, the Arab Arabian mind, that means the Islam, Islamic mind at all, is a mind of the text and in a normative way. It always looks for norms and rules in the text, starts from the text and creates rules and so on. And this asked us again about the question of hermeneutic. Which kind of text hermeneutic can we use in Islamic practical theology? It's able to look in the text, not about norm and rules, but about experience, for example. This is a question of Islamic text hermeneutic, and it's really important for Islamic pastoral care. Anyways, there is some, I tried to show you some questions i'm thinking about it and like to share with you but i like to come back to the question of interreligious and interdisciplinary cooperation i think from the islamic perspective is very able and there is a very founded background for interreligious cooperation i tried to show you with the concept of pair as example but we have a many concepts how can support it but it's very important for interreligious cooperation to look for the important point that interreligious pastoral care or spiritual care can feel even such a concept is theologically and normatively well-founded and stable. The successful and non-successful of such cooperation and its real effects depended more on attitude and behavior than on theological foundation. This leads to a set of values and choice of which no infrastructure yet exists. We must therefore work for interreligious and intercultural pastoral care in the sense, in the meaning that the situation is not only possible to cooperate, but is meaningful for each other, for all of the traditions. Also, it's not only about integrating interface practice into an existing healing culture. That means I open my office for the new colleagues from Buddhism, from Hinduism, or the, the Christian colleagues, open the offices for the Muslim colleagues, but it's about a creating an interface culture, creating a new interface culture. Let me show you this maybe on this picture. This picture, what you see, is a build new building of Islamic studies in Germany, the Center of Islamic Theology, the new building. We decided 
not we as me, but the university and the politic decided it's not enough to start a new studies in Tübingen for Islamic theology, but we have to make it interactive a daily life. So decided to new and be building very close to the Catholic and Protestant faculties. And we share together the library, the restaurants, the cafeteria, the rooms, classic classrooms, the offices. Some of our colleagues have rooms in the Protestant faculty. Some of the colleagues, they have their yeah, offices in our building, in our, that means not Muslim, but our Tunisian building. And we called all of these three buildings together, campus of religions, campus of theology. So we need not only to integrate interface practice in the existing practice, but we need to create a new culture of interface cooperation together to become a daily life, not choice to have it. I think this is enough. Let me finish last point. If we, conclusion of all of this, that means from the Islamic perspective, the life is a, like a journey. If you come home from your journey, and this is especially for Basrakia, yeah, you have to decide what you need. Some people need tea, some people need hot coffee, some people need a shower, hot shower, cold shower. If the family at home decided for you, you need to eat because you have a long uh, journey or you need to sleep, it will not be comfortable enough for you. So you have to decide, and our pastor caregivers have to listen to the people, what they need, not to decide for them. People and their people are like planets in your garden. Some needs more water, some needs a sun, others grow better in the shade, others in the desert, and still others on the riverbank. If you treat all plants in the same way, they will remain unfermented and imperfect and people are the same. What that means for our practice and for our research as an academic? Let me two points and I close, I promise you, <laughs> Professor Thomas, it's my last two. Uh... For the practice, we need a professional theological competence, we need an interreligious competence, we need an interculture and interdisciplinary competence, and sensitivity for diversity and variety and reflexness. For the research from the Islamic pastor Akia, we need a theological foundation because the Muslim society still believe very strong what can we find in the Quran and the Prophet tradition. So it's important to show them what is the theological background of pastor Akia. We need to a historical and culture research to show them it's not only a, a, a theory, but it's a practice able to do what we find in the theory. And we need an empirical research to have a relationship to the lived religion and to reflect the reality to still seem close to the people in their daily lives. Problem, and all of this can work and should, and I think there's no choice in the next times to work interreligious together and interdisciplinary. Thank you for listening. And there's some reference and I'm happy to listen to you. Thank you. I think I'm in time. You're great. Thank you so okay. much, Dr. Abdella, for um, really walking us through um, Islamic spiritual care and building upon what we heard from um, doctors, sorry, I'm gonna, <laughs> Nazila, what we heard from Nazila about um, the unity of body and soul um, and, the, and the fact that Islam carries the term health in its very title and that this concept is central. Um, and I really appreciated you articulating the typology of theological approaches to Islamic spiritual care and then diving into the beard concept 
um, and really talking about how this makes, um, points out the many ways that this makes peace of mind possible, really considering pastoral care as relational work, a relational work that you came back to at, at the end when you were talking about um, interfaith uh, cooperation, um, but that it also makes room for misunderstanding. It's a term that is known to other cultures, speaks to patience. Um, and I really uh, appreciate how, how both of you held the, the sort of conundrum of what is Islamic practical theology, um, that it's difficult to pin down a definition, particularly when practice is associated with so many multiple understandings, um, and that um, and and that we really need to think about and the call and the invitation to think about practical theology in a new way at this new time in light of new contexts, new challenges, new understandings of religion, um, new attitudes about um, interreligious competence, et cetera. So um, thank you for um, to both of you for offering these um, really insightful and informative uh, presentations. And I know that we have very much appreciated them. Um, so I believe at this time, um, we are going to go back into our breakout rooms. Um, so it looks like we'll be in breakout rooms for about 15 minutes, and then um, we'll have about a 10 minute break after that. And then we will gather back here at 11 for concluding words um, and projections. So um, if you have any questions about any of this, feel free to, to throw something in the chat. Um, but if I don't see you before 11, have a lovely uh, time in your breakout groups. Now I did leave it so that co-hosts can stay in the main room here. If you do want to go to a breakout room, that's fine. Um, you can just tell me which uh, that you want to go and I can place you in a breakout room. So that's an option. You, you mean the co-host is uh, Professor oh. Thomas or the speakers? Because all of us have now the co-host. <laughs> Yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah so the people that yeah. are left here on the screen Looks um, like we lost Nazila though she's not here or did she is she in a breakout group uh, she did go to a breakout group okay. right. Dr. Yeah. Odell, would you like to go to a breakout group up to you <laughs> why not <laughs> is there any, any uh, preference or can I choose or I give go to the first one <laughs> you can go to the the first one if you want to. Sure. Okay. What I do you have uh, any? Before, uh, Mah Mahmoud, before we do that, uh, please, I want to say something, please. and that is this concept of beer and piety is so interesting because in Spanish, piedad means both the devotion to God and compassion. And what is striking is that, you know, the Arabic Islamic cultures were in Spain for eight centuries. And mm -hmm. our Spanish language, that's my first language, has a lot of words from the Arabic. So it resonates beautifully. And I I think there is a connection. Well, I know there is a connection with the mm -hmm. way that this bear uh, concept that you explained for us sort of got um, integrated uh, linguistically uh, in uh, in Spanish. Uh, oh. Now, unfortunately, that's not the way uh, in all other languages. Uh, not even in English, frankly, because piety is not. The, unless for implication, but explicitly the reference. So I wanted to affirm that, and it was um, 
uh, I, I was kind of moved by your highlighting that. I bring, brought to my mind all that <laughs> linguistic cultural um, association. And there's much more, but we'll be in communication elsewhere. Yes, thank you very much for this feedback. This is a very important point. Do you know what is this? Uh, called it in Spain? What is the uh, Spanish? This is uh, the translation of Pera in Spanish. Do you know how the, can we call it? The, well, I speak that. The, uh, be, the beer. Uh, that was uh, what I was alluding is like how in the Spanish language has adopted many, many words that come from the Arabic. You, you, we have Allah, oh Allah. We have a number, al muhada mm -hmm. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, words, and uh, so that that is one connection. I was mm -hmm. alluding to that, and that uh, in our religious and theological language, when we talk about piety, we actually uh, explicitly connect the love of God with the love of neighbor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and compassion. So anyway, and it was it was interesting uh, to to see from you uh, explain that way. Me, yes, thank you. I, I think we have to to complete uh, to continue this discussion in another way, because I think this is the point what you said: the love of God that means love of neighbors. I think that is the main point in this verse. Especially this misunderstanding to think uh, the first Muslim society was happy about the religion and decided this is, I have to spend all my time in the mosque to pray in the West, in the West to, to, to Jerusalem or to Mecca and Quran explained to them this is not the correct way to be really a uh, good religious uh, Muslim. You have to think on the people and to support them in many ways. Oh, then okay. please go ahead. No, just briefly, your reference to creating a culture it was so interesting that the Society for Intercultural Practical Council, we have in 2018 our meeting in Vienna, but it was at the Muslim, uh, at the Islamic Center for the very first time outside Christian universities and centers. And we experienced a little bit of the culture that you were talking about, creating um, conviviality, shall I say, mm. <laughs> that transcends our differences ideologically and otherwise even theologically and say, wow, we are in this together. We are humans who can really love each other as neighbors <laughs> and create community um, together. So uh, that is... As Wien, Wien, Wien is a very, very interesting uh, institute. I, I, I was teaching in, in, in Vienna to Islamic Pesach here, and at, I was the first time there, and all of the colleagues who gives me the key, show me the classroom, and so on, was a, a Catholic and Protestant colleagues from the another departments, because the Muslim colleague was left. This is very interesting interaction in Vienna too. Yeah. 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 Uh, Doctor Abdullah. Uh, if may I, uh, my name is Elias or Elias. I'm in Sacramento, in California. Um, you mentioned uh, that in your tradition, uh, I'm Christian myself. Mm -hmm. um, you you have seen that in the Islamic tradition, uh, spiritual care is incorporated as a part of the the physician training. I'm wondering if you can speak more about that. I I, I think this was the colleague Nazila, not? 
this is my colleague Nazila. I, I, I tried to show that this uh, spiritual care or the Islamic pastoral care is, is included in the Islamic tradition in the ways that we don't know any division between body and soul. From the beginning of the Islamic tradition, there's a, a new unity together, unity together. And if soul is suffering, body will be suffering too. And is, if body is suffering, soul will suffer too. We have some Muslim uh, scholars who said that actually the soul of the prophet is that the main point of them, if the soul very clear enough, does that mean it's, it's don't have any problem with another people? It's open to have the scripture from God. And all of this wonder of the prophet is just moving and happened with the soul of them. But the special field you mentioned, this, I think that was the speak, uh, abolition of the Dr. Nazila for this interaction uh, fields. We have in Germany this master of Islamic Pasake and social work, but social work is another colleague is doing this. I was just doing the Islamic Pasake from the Islamic theological perspective. So it will be no able to speak about sociology and psychology for me. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. I, I mixed the, the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, in your imagination, if, uh, if you train uh, a physician incorporate that the spiritual care, what would you consider? Excuse me? Can, can, can you repeat again? I, I didn't in get your it. imagination, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to incorporate uh, pastoral care, spiritual care in the training of a physician. What things would you consider? Uh, I think... Uh... Professor Thomas mentioned that one of my research field is theology of coexistence. So if my understanding of cooperation is more than to make interface courses together, it's more than to share our office together. I think for me, it is important to think about especially what that means interreligious to cooperate in pastoral care. We have many fields for cooperation, but one of the very important questions is the question about how can we cooperate in the very sensitive situation like at the end of life? Can we have this situation as a still? Would a interreligious cooperation is just to have understanding and the tolerance for another people that can be exist in this society? My understanding of interreligious cooperation is more than both of them. It should be move us to the situation that we don't wonder anymore that people cooperate together interreligious. It is like our culture. It is our daily lives. Especially we will, if we speak from a spiritual case that we have to take care of the patients what they need, so we have to take care of them, of the accept that Caregivers from another religion can support him or not. This is important to keep in mind too of, of this. But it's for me more than to make some causes in my institution and ask one of my Christian colleagues to share the course with me. It's more than this. Um, I would like to thank so much. Um... We're in constantly contact, though, that uh, I uh, quit this. But um, what would you say uh, in hospital? Um, should there, uh, if, if, if you have a team of uh, uh, medical doctors and nurses and, and uh, spiritual caregivers, chaplains, and so on, um, how should all of them be trained to be able uh, to support uh, people adequately in all uh, uh, dimensions. So which training could you offer for, for medical doctors, for physicians, for nurses, and so on? Is it uh, part of this interfaith uh, concept uh, you have in mind? Or 
uh, is it rather that uh, uh, the 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 um, religious traditions uh, should uh, um, or the, the different religious traditions should uh, uh, be in contact with with the other professions? I think this is. I think this is for me. It's put together, but I'm living in a reality life. I'm asking myself sometimes, what can we do? I think the second one we mentioned that the religions keep in touch together. It should be normative today. In normative today, in not that only cooperate, but just to move each other to reflect about our traditions. As I mentioned, we can think together about new understanding of practical theology. You don't need to think about it as about stunt. You have it about 200 years. You have a tradition, mini literature, but I can move you to think about it if I present you my tradition, my understanding. And I can learn too much from you because I have two, at least 200 years history and tradition. You know, this is very important to me to know this, but I can understand this especially correct if you help me to and explain me what that means, especially. Not to read alone the books. I can do it, but it's not enough. If we move to the personal in the hospitals, I think the hospital as a secular institutions they are thinking about money. The idea of if we move a personal to be part of this interreligious cooperation, we have to explain to, to them what is the profit, uh, profit what you have, what you will win, what that, that means for the hospitals. And we have to keep in mind that the personal is very, very all the time in the, in, in the work. But it's, it's, it's the ideal way mm. that the personal in the hospitals at least know about the important things for the patients. And I'm thinking especially from the Muslim way, if my students go to the hospital and think about all of Muslim in my uh, uh, master degree are Sunni, if you go to the Shia one. Mm -hmm. If you have only the idea from the television about Shia, <laughs> this is a big problem. And if the doctor asks them what that means, and he answers from the Sunni perspective, this is not pastor case, this is not supporting. It's more for more problems. That means in the hospital context, we have to take care which resource we have. Mm. And what can we do especially? Because not everything what we're interested in it, can we uh, move it to reality? Mm. But it's, it, it's interesting to have a good relationship to the medical personnel yeah. in the understanding we are teams. No, we are not two teams. Yeah. We are one team with a different professional fields, like some medical person at themselves. They are different, mm. but as a team. And if I reach this situation, that we are part, not a tolerance, okay, we allow you to be part, we give you the information, but we are part of this. We discuss with you on the Augenhöhe and the same, in the same way as a, I think we can reach too much with this. <laughs> and we have very interesting experience from the hospital, from the ethic uh, rat in the hospitals, yeah. that some doctors are angry about it. If you discuss one of these cases with a, with a pastor caregivers, mm -hmm. it's my case, why you discuss about it? You can't tell me what I have to do and what not. At, uh, still, yeah. we have very. We think it is, it is today is normal. It's not. It's still not normal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's sensitive relationship still between. I think we have a lot to, to work. And I hope, George, I answered. Uh, I understand your your question in the right way and uh, answered in the right way. Yeah. One way that we can also 
influence positively is in, in for helping from our perspectives inform the the narrative ethics that now is a subject in many medical schools Le helping the physicians in training to do the assessment and the choice of therapies as a collaborative work, collaborative way in which spiritual concerns of the patients are taken into consideration. So in the, in the programs of medical formation, uh, uh, already in, the, in, in North America, but also elsewhere, maybe that is one way one avenue in which we can humbly uh, contribute uh, so that the physicians in training become competent in a collaborative way of um, helping people understand what is going on in their lives and where it's sickness and in treatment. Uh, but what you brought is, is uh, so important to that effect. So thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Um, Abd uh, Abdallah, um, you make a differen differentiation at the beginning of your presentation, if I remember correct, that in Islamic tradition, uh, you emphasize virtue ethics instead of normative ethics. I wonder if you can expand a little more about that. <clears throat> As, as the subject of ethic, ethics in Islam is a very, very complicated subject because we, uh, what I mentioned in our uh, discussion or for our um, subject today, I tried to say that the medicine, ethics, and philosophy were in, in interactive relationship together that some scholars come to the result that we discuss a medicine cases in philosophical vocabulary, and we discuss a ethical subjects in medicine vocabulary. That means people understand ethics is good for the soul, and medicine is good for the body, and we have to connect all together to get a healthy people and healthy society. But if we speak especially that I tried to, to show at the first was this short city, uh, situation. But if we speak about <clears throat> Islamic ethics in general, we will say that still there's many publications about Islamic ethics, but if you ask about the theory of Islamic ethics, can we do Islamic ethics without a normative perspective? The question is still open in the, in the Islamic discussion. Can we lose it from each other? But we started in the modern time, a very new research is about the ethic. We had until I think the 60 years last century, there's no any publication about a theory of ethics in the Islamic tradition. We have a many articles, many discussion, but still was a part of the normative discussion. Of the Islamic law, and was started, and uh, the first the first publication was written in in France from a Muslim scholar, from Muslim Arabic scholar, but the reaction of the university at this publication was not very so happy about it. It took me about twenty years until we was allowed to study it on the. Uh, normal uh, academic context because he said we have a. Ethics theory, and we have an Islamic law, and we can depend it from each other. And it was interesting to say today if you look to the Islamic pastor here and look to many publications of the medicine ethic, ethics, you will find all the time it's that is with looking to the cases with the microscope of the Islamic law what is allowed and what is not allowed. So the discussion of the ethic in the Islamic tradition now is moving to the discussion about the human image in the Islamic tradition. 
and it became more important in the next time, of course, of the Anthropocene discussion and natural uh, uh, climate change and so on. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for the continued intriguing conversation. Um, again, I, I want to take the time to thank uh, Dr. Akolatse, Dr. Iskandarova, and Dr. Abdallah for their really thought-provoking and insightful presentations. Um, so we are here at the conclusion of our symposium. Um, and um, I want to thank all of you, uh, whether you've joined us for one of the days or one of the presentations or the entire symposium, we want to um, thank you for making the time to be present and to engage in this really important dialogue. Uh, I am going to pass this over to uh, Dr. Scapani and Dr. Lutens to um, conclude our time together. Thank you so much. Um... Professor <clears throat> Leah, a dear colleague here, uh, and to all the presenters, this has been such a wonderful time. And today, um, uh, in particular, um, so the, in this symposium, we gather in order to consider the question of how our diverse spiritual, religious, theological wisdom traditions connect with the manifold resources from the social behavioral sciences and clinical psychology in particular. We have been richly blessed with the input provided by all of you today and in the previous two days. Our second uh, and related uh, goal has been to foster reflection and dialogue among, among ourselves and the representatives of diverse normative traditions. And we want to continue collaboration. As uh, we indicated in passing at the beginning, uh, uh, Tuesday, this is the first time that we have an event like this co-sponsored by our um, other, shall I say, sister uh, association, uh, the Society for Intercultural uh, Pastoral Care and Counseling. Uh, we are delighted to uh, continue working on this uh, in the coming weeks uh, and months. Uh, I also, before um, I give the Last word to uh, Dr. Dominic Lutens wants to remind us that we'll continue uh, this reflection in two or three different ways. One will, one will be with a bulletin that we will be uh, sharing with all of you who register and others who might want to join us to keep you informed uh, periodically and uh, as frequently as possible. So we maintain the momentum here, right? And also as um, several of us and others have, would be invited, um, continue to systematically reflect and write uh, towards um, a major text that we um, trust will be ready next year. So with immense gratitude uh, to all of you, um, I'm very happy to give uh, the, the time to uh, Dominic to also uh, greet us at this moment. Uh, thank you. Uh, dear friend Daniel, um, it was a wonderful symposium, and I have some thoughts that that uh, that or some memories that I will take uh, from it. Um, I think the topic uh, of wisdom traditions uh, was very well chosen. 
uh, because it opened the perspective uh, for me. Uh, it was an eye opener to also consider the social sciences, the psychotherapy, also as wisdom traditions uh, that you're in dialogue with, um, as uh, Daniel also said in the introduction. So that is one, one uh, element. Another element that I take uh, from it is that all the speakers and also in the conversations, there was, we were a learning community here. Uh, and uh, there was um, an atmosphere of uh, respect uh, and um, confidence in, in their own approach, but at the same time, not uh, being, um, it was not closed. There was an atmosphere of we are all learning here and there is no such thing as a universal concept uh, i think that anthony was was saying that although he comes from a humanistic tradition where uh enlightenment thinking was uh, a try uh, was was focusing on trying to get a universal understanding uh, of things uh so that we are situated in our own context that we think from that perspective and that that qualifies us as practitioners and also as scholars um, to do the kind of work that we do. Um, so that's that is also something that I take away from from this uh, symposium. Another thing that I take away from it, and and I applaud uh, the the young uh, people that I met, the students and and young scholars and practitioners. Uh, I am a middle aged person. Uh, so everybody uh, uh, who is younger inspired me in, in the way that uh, I think there is focus uh, more than uh, when I was trained uh, on uh, transcendence, on the mystery of the work that we do, that we don't uh, are not able totally to describe also what we do, and that we are invited together with uh, the patients, the clients, the people that we work with to uh, open up, uh, to stay open uh, to this transcendent uh, spiritual uh, mystery uh, dimension. Um, and a last thing that I want to say is that uh, before I uh, go to my advertisement, um, is that um, we, although we come from different traditions, we have the same passion, and there is also a kind of commonality of language. Uh, in uh, so we, there is a way to understand each other, uh, and uh, I think. Uh, again, when I was going to SIPCC uh, conferences, um, the context that, that I'm familiar with 10 years ago, sometimes people were meeting each other for the first time, a person from a different tradition, a Muslim tradition, a colleague from a different tradition. And now one generation further, it's self-evidently so that we as colleagues meet each other, discuss things. Uh, exchange concepts uh, and language that we mutually can understand. And it's also thanks to the training that you all got, the experiences that you collected, the experience in daily life of meeting uh, in interfaith uh, teams and cooperating that uh, also uh, could create this kind of atmosphere that we had here. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, all the good work that you all are doing, uh, everyone who was present here uh, at this uh, symposium. Uh, and now I go shortly, uh, I will keep it very short to my advertisement. Um, so the SIPCC, Society for Intercultural Pastoral Care and Counseling will have a seminary at the end of October. Uh, so it's three days October and uh, two days uh, November and that's, specific week uh, and the topic will be spaces and places in intercultural and interreligious care and counseling so i think it's it's a good um i heard already from some people that they will join uh, because uh, uh it is in germany but at the same time also online so we also create a kind of online format similar to this one 
uh, in which uh, partly uh, uh, the online participants will also listen to people who are in the room in, in Germany, but we will create our own atmosphere and own uh, workshops and own uh, discuss some, uh, ways of discussion with each other online. Uh, so I invite you to uh, take a look on our website, uh, sipcc.org, uh, uh, International Seminar, if you uh, Google that, because SIPCC is uh, apparently also a military term related to tank installation, so don't go there. SIPCC International Seminar, and then you will uh, you can click on English, and then you will find all the information in English. Uh, and uh, the online seminar will take place on the 28th of October, the 29th of October, and the 31st uh, uh, of October online, uh, and also European time in the afternoon, so that also people from uh, 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 the Americas uh, can easily uh, join our discussion. So, uh, we, uh, SIPCC and the International Association for Spiritual Care, um, will continue the trustful cooperation uh, that we have built up, uh, and uh, we will uh, cooperate even more in the future, uh, and I'm very grateful uh, uh, to that. Uh, so thank you all for uh, the trust, and thank you for the wonderful uh, work that uh, you have done. Uh, as sister organization, as Daniel uh, said. So let's keep up the good work and thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, the very last word is from my colleague, Lia here. Um, so go ahead. Um, well, I just want to provide my heartfelt gratitude to all of you um, for being here and for being open. Um, I, I encourage you, um, to, to sort of take, um, these new concepts, these new relationships, these new insights and ideas, um, this sensitivity to diversity that we have experienced, um, this living tradition, um, these skills of deep listening, um, to take all of this, um, into your heart and into your work and into your being. Um, and um, that I, I guess my, uh, my benediction for all of us is uh, that we may, um, in our knowing, in our, in our being and in our doing, that we may embody um, some of some, just a glimpse of uh, the understanding and the compassion and the peace that we experienced with one another in this place. Amen. So I pray that all of you will go in peace today. Um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation, um, as Dr. Lutens mentioned, uh, in October. So put those dates on your calendar, the 28th, 29th, 31st, for the SIPCC online conference. And um, and uh, I don't know if it's, uh, I can say this, Daniel, but we will also have an in-person gathering next uh, fall, dates to be determined, uh, hopefully in Chicago. So, uh, so keep your eyes and ears peeled for information on that uh, follow-up gathering. Go in peace today, friends.